Hi, welcome to the next talk on culture, foreign policy and society in times of change. I'm back in Ukraine, in the east of Ukraine, where I will meet Nastya Hlesova, a curator from Kharkiv, and Dasha Romanenko and Yulia Zakachenko. And they are both activists in Slavyansk, where the war has started in 2014. The war is still ongoing and it remains one of the current challenges for Ukraine. Ukraine has 1.5 million IDPs and the project we are talking about will try and is trying to help them with art. Nasia, very nice to meet you here. We are in the outskirts of Kharkiv in a gallery. It's your gallery, Garage 127. And uh, it's a really tiny place. And you decided in a neighborhood to open this project. So tell me more about it. Yeah, so uh, me and my partner, we live here and uh, we are working in art and are working as a curatorial group for six years now uh, and we really wanted to, to create something uh, ours and we had the garage uh, so uh, we decided that uh, this space uh, is meant to be our artist run space and uh, to uh, create uh, like the safe space for community and uh, the space for experiments in art especially for emerging artists so do you have a mission because you are a curator? Yes, uh, for me it's very important to work with emerging art uh, and to uh, help emerging artists uh, to show themselves. And also for me it's uh, so important uh, to work with horizontal links in art. Uh, that means uh, that artists and curators and other cultural agents would work together uh, to create something joint uh, without any, uh, anyone who would be in lead. Uh, but to uh, make decisions together. So, which kind of exhibitions did you launch since the opening in 2019? Uh, we uh, had uh, s different kinds of uh, projects, uh, but our main program uh, now is uh, the first exhibition program. Uh, it's a series of exhibitions. We uh, held it from 2020 and we continued this year. Uh, for uh, artists who want to experiment with their first exhibition ever and we as curators and people who have some experience uh, in working with uh, art and artists we help them to work with space uh, to put uh, their project together and to show it to people. I was in Kharkiv for the first time in 2014 so shortly after the war has started and Kharkiv became something like a security hub for people from Donbass who had to flee. You yourself, you're from Luhansk. Did you arrive during that time also? No, I actually came to Kharkiv to study in 2011, uh, shortly after my sister did the same. Uh, and uh, I've been here uh, before the war and after the war uh, and Kharkiv is indeed a safe uh, place for me and I know that a lot of uh, my ex-classmates or people uh, from Luhansk uh, come here uh, and uh, my family uh, were here uh, during the war time too. So did you, did you go back to your native town Luhansk during all the years because the war is still ongoing so it was not only a short time um, that, yeah, that as perhaps many thought that the war will end very soon. 
Yeah, and we actually we thought about it too. Uh, so when my family, my parents came here, they thought it would be for a short period uh, because they didn't have enough savings to buy uh, some apartment here and they had to move back to Luhansk uh, and that's why I went there uh, several times during these last years. Of course it's very sad to see uh, my native city like this because it's some kind of the skeleton of the city. A lot of places were destroyed and uh, it's uh, looks like it uh, became uh, emptier and even smaller. In Kharkiv many IDPs are li uh, living. Do you think that the town changed itself during the last years because of that? I think that uh, war uh, changed Kharkiv indeed. Uh, not only IDPs, uh, but they brought a lot of, because uh, people from Donbass uh, people from Crimea, uh, of course, they bring their culture and their uh, skills and their talents to city. So the city grows and becomes bigger, unlike Luhansk. Um, and of course, war changed because uh, people are awake now and they understand uh, how close Kharkiv were uh, to be the same as uh, Donbass region because we had this moment when we uh, had the uh, idea of uh, Kharkiv National Republic uh, and uh, I'm so happy it didn't happen and I think that a lot of people in Kharkiv understand now how important uh, it uh, to know about the political and social uh, things that are happening in our country. So do you think that these people or you, you are integrated already in, as a citizen of Kharkiv or you also faced some challenges or problems during this uh, time after the war has started? Uh, well, I, I definitely am integrated now and I feel uh, like I'm Kharkiv person now, no, not only Donbass, but Kharkiv too. Uh, but of course, uh, some challenges, uh, especially with my parents who came in 2014, uh, we uh, faced them. Uh, for example, uh, when they came, uh, I we were trying to find an apartment for them, and a lot of people they uh, won't like to uh, rent their uh, homes to people from Donbass and they uh, directly told us that uh, you are from Donbass, we won't let you in our apartments. So did this change the situation? So there's more solidarity um, between our Kharkiv, um, let's say native Kharkiv born and the people from Donbass? I think so. I think that now uh, people not uh, necessarily uh, even ask if you are from Donbass region, so they don't mind if you are from there. And it's really, really uh, big relief for all of us because we are not some kind of strangers. We are Ukrainians. So you say that there is a special, let's say, solidarity uh, also with the um, inhabitants of Donbass region. So why they are different? So I think that uh, if you meet someone and you uh, learn that this person uh, is from Donbass region, uh, you uh, uh, both of you feel that you have something in common, some common uh, maybe memories or some uh, common understanding of the world because Donbass region, especially in 90s uh, when I was a child, did a lot of people um, were, uh, who I know were ch uh, children. Uh, it was very poor region and uh, we have a lot of mines and uh, we had miners strikes and uh, through uh, all my childhood uh, I saw it and I know that the people who, fr uh, who are from Donbass and spent their ch uh, childhood there, uh, they remember it too. So we have something in common. So how artists reflect the recent years, the war, for example, um, do, this, do, do, you can, do you see it in, in the artworks, for example? Yeah, of course. Uh, a lot of people are working with the topic of uh, the, the war itself. 
uh, and uh, even more they are working with the topic of uh, their uh, like uh, memories of, of uh, their native land uh, because uh, some someone won't go uh, back to Lugansk Donetsk because they don't have relatives there so they just can uh, imagine how their native cities are now uh, look like you just uh in preparing a launch of a new project in reflecting collective memory, not only collective memory from IDPs, but everyone, like artists, who came to a new city. Tell me more about it. Yeah, it's a project, it will be the virtual uh, map uh, where we will place uh, the stories in uh, different artistic forms. It could be video or text or painting uh, or graphic work uh, that will tell uh, the viewer uh, the story of uh, your movement, like how you were uh, transferred, how you travel to another place and what it uh, became for you. Why is it so important to reflect this? Where, where, are, you com where are you coming from? I think that um, these uh, stories, uh, they can uh, teach us uh, and uh, help us understand uh, other people. I think that uh, art reflects uh, the personal uh, stories, personal memories, and it uh, helps viewers to learn something new or something uh, different from their own point of view and to uh, make them look wider to the world. You're not the only one who is involved in this project, but also Yulia Zakhavchenko from Slavians, for example, and another artist from, from Italy. So does it make it very special like to, to join forces or what's the, what's the added value to work with your partners? Yeah, it's actually a very... Uh, uh, important for me to work with others and uh, in this project um, with Martina and Julia who are from different sectors. Uh, Martina is from academia sector and uh, Julia is from social sector and I'm from artistic one. Uh, for me it's a, a gr great pleasure to work with people who have different points of views. So I was so lucky to meet them during Ukraine calling project and uh, to uh, have this possibility to think of something new that w we could do together. So you work with the IDPs, do you think art can, can help uh, in a way, not only like in an aesthetical reflection, but into, into helping to find a new uh, life in, in other cities, let's say, in other parts of Ukraine? Yeah, of course, I think that uh, art can help to uh, tell uh, the world about yourself and also to, to help the world to understand you. That's uh, one of the m like main uh, ideas of uh, such a project uh, like ours. And what are your plans for the future with this space or other spaces you're creating? Well, now we are uh, working with a podcast uh, that will be our new uh, point of uh, talking to our uh, community, to our visitors, uh, because uh, we will be more uh, worldwide, <laughs> I, can I can say. And of course, we want uh, to have uh, more and more joint projects with uh, other artist-run spaces or small horizontal initiatives in Ukraine and abroad. Thank you so much for the talk. Thank you.
Hi Julia. Hi Carolina. Hi. It's nice to meet you. We are in Slavyansk. It's your home city and uh, you have a project which is um, finance or working within the Ukraine calling program. Tell me a little about it. And in fact, I was not. It's not my native town. I was uh, living in Taretsk, but I moved here uh, because of the war and because my work is related to IDPs, and my office is here in Slavyansk. So, and as I was working with IDPs, and I know uh, what kind of problems they uh, face, and uh, as I also was displaced for some time, I can understand it deeply, uh, and. Uh, What I understood not uh, long ago, that uh, many problems that are not really administrative or social, but they are kind of emotional and psychological, and, and uh, there is uh, not enough reflection on what is going on inside people. Uh, for example, when I was uh, displaced and I went to Dnipro and Ivano-Frankivsk and then to Vinnytska Oblast and then to Boryspil, Uh, I came through some transformation as I realized, uh, in sense how I perceived myself as a citizen and uh, related to my identity. Who am I? Am I a like, Ukrainian citizen or the citizen of my native town? And there was, I didn't think about that uh, that much, but I felt some transformations. And only now I can realize what kind of transformation it was. And I think it's very important uh, to understand and to uh, go with that further. And our project that deals with uh, this issue uh, in the form of art, I think it's a good opportunity for people to rethink their experience of displacement and their experience of uh, their realizing them as citizen their citizenships and uh, what where they belong to so uh, that's why we have uh, started this project in fact uh, Martina Urbinati was the uh, idea generator so when I heard her I really I wanted to join this project at once because it's a really great topic beside the project uh, you just mentioned that IDPs they they're going through a transformation Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Well, if I can speak from my own experience, uh, I came through different phases of my identity and uh, perceiving my citizenship. For example, at first when I moved, I didn't want to return and I felt some kind of disgust to my native town where all that stuff happened with all this seizure of uh, power and all the armed men and lots of acquaintances told bad things about me so I didn't want to return and I didn't want to feel that I belong there I want just to cut all my ties that I had there but uh, as long as I were traveling through Ukraine and when especially when I was working as a volunteer on a hotline in Kyiv and we were helping people to evacuate from the cities that were sheltered at the time, I felt that I still belong there. And I felt the urge to return there, to be there and to develop this area. And this transformation, it was very hard for me, but it was not realized. Uh, and only with this project, when we were developing it, I um, resort all this and I felt that I still need to uh, tell about it and help other people to tell about it and just to transform it into this in the form that can be then be useful to themselves and to the community and how this project can really help IDPs so what do you expect from this outcome uh, I expect that people can uh, in fact, uh, say, accept their own experience because sometimes what we have uh, faced and what we have suffered through, it is difficult to talk about and it's difficult to think about. And as long as it is difficult, it becomes a problem, it becomes inside us like a trauma. And when you transform it, it, be it becomes easier, it's some kind of relief.
at least it's my belief. So art can help into like transforming trauma into like accepting this what happened in Ukraine. Yes, and it's a very light and very mild form, like because when we're talking about politics or activism, it's quite straight and not all people have courage or desire to do that. And art can, it's like a media through which we can do that. And tell me a little bit more about your organization and why you work for IDPs. Our organization is called Charitable Fund Right to Protection and we have been dealing with IDPs and conflict affected populations since 2014. And, and I've been working with this organization since 2015. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, I joined this organization because as a former IDP I understood that People need support with their housing, with their legal issues, and just support. And I wanted like, to make community better because there was lots of suffering, and I wanted to just have my at least little contribution there. And uh, since that time, we have uh, consulted, uh, I would say, even tens of thousands of people, and we led them through difficult procedures of getting pensions, of getting documents, social benefits. For some people we even helped with accommodation, for example, to find an adequate housing, and we're still doing this. So I think that it's the activity that really help people. And which moment was the, which moment in your work touched, touched you the most? It's very difficult to say because uh, myself, I mostly don't uh, deal with IDPs themselves because I mostly deal with information, but it's very important to collect information, it's, evident, uh, it's evidence, and then based on that evidence we can advocate for system changes like legislation and all the procedures. And maybe for me, the most important moment when we gathered uh, information about uh, entry exit checkpoints, about their condition there, they were absolutely inadequate. It violated dignity and any sanitary norms. And we strongly advocated for changing, for reconstruction. And finally, reconstruction of all the ACPs have been done. And I think that it's so. Uh, I mean, the contribution of, of our organization is really strong there. We are in Slavyansk, not so far from the contact line, still, and the war is ongoing, seven years. Um, so how you how you think about this transformation of the city where where the war was actually also taking place in 2014? Well, uh, if you think about the war, now in Slavyansk there are very few places where you can still see some remnants of war, like destroyed building, like that hospital in Semenivka, but most buildings were reconstructed and repaired. And I think that after all those uh, events and after the uh, liberation of Slavyansk, uh, there was a wave of activism, of people trying to do something good for their country or for their city. And it seems to me that, uh, for example, street art uh, started developing uh, more after all these events. And it, uh, around the town you can find the bureaus that were created after those, like in the recent years. And you have a cooperation with German organizations, also with the Ukraine Calling program. Um, how you explain Germans, what happens here? Do you think uh, we, we, because if you're not, if you have not seen the war, how can perhaps uh, the other side understand it? How you explain it? Well, it depends on the, what people know about that. But I mainly uh, tell that some armed people with no signs of any troops or any country, they just uh, came to the cities with arms and in mass, and they just took the power, in fact. 
and that uh, uh, local police they didn't take any actions uh, because uh, maybe they had no we don't know why maybe it was the betrayal or maybe they just didn't uh, have some commands and they, they didn't know what to do and I also talk about that uh, it is definitely a uh, like, Russian trace there because uh, some uh, on the videos you can uh, hear that people are talking in a very different way and sometimes they use words that local people never use and for example my friends in Bahmud when they, they were encountering with those armed men they even mixed the time zone and that was very uh, demonstrative because like you know we have one hour difference with Russian and from this German Ukrainian corporations how how Germany can help like in fact of supporting this uh, your project and of course in, in helping um, yeah IDPs I get, Germany is helping I know they have projects uh, related to housing and it's extremely important because housing is one of the main problems for IDPs because Housing is basic. When you have some place to live, it's easier to find job and it's easier to solve all other problems. And for example, Kaifa is now financing a, like uh, a loan, special loan for IDPs. It's uh, low interest, so IDPs have the opportunity to find and buy housing with this help. As for other uh, projects and other ways to support, I think it's important to support dialogues and to speak about the problems, to articulate them, because the more problem is articulated, the more uh, ways can be found to solve it.